Hi, I'm uh, Montemoy Regional School Superintendent Scott Carpenter, and I would really like to thank you uh, for coming out tonight to listen to the speaker. Uh, as superintendent, I'm very proud of this school district. Uh, we were the only school district on the Cape uh, that's opted to give the Youth Risk Behavior Survey to our students in the recent years and openly share the findings with our community. We did so to start a community-wide discussion, to have a conversation about how we can work together to help our teens make healthy decisions. As a community, we can choose to either ignore drug and alcohol use and abuse and let it become the elephant in the room until there's a tragedy and then ask why didn't we have conversations or acknowledge that there's a problem, care enough to make things better and work together towards that end to hopefully prevent tragedies. I'm also very proud of our peer leaders who gave that presentation on the youth risk behavior survey data and under the guidance of our wellness teacher, Angie Chalaka, have started a conversation amongst their peers. So tonight we have with us Carly Donovan, who will be introducing our speaker. And I'd just like to leave you with, what there be one. <laughs> with, uh, with uh, the uh, sage words from uh, one of the great poets of our time, Dr. Seuss, uh, who says, in the Lorax, Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And I thank you tonight for coming and caring and being part of this conversation. And now for Carl. Okay. Um, hello, I'm Carly Deniman, and I'm a junior here at Monomoy. Um, and a member of the Montemoy Peer Leads. Um, as many of you know, in the past decade, Cape Cod towns have been experiencing a rise in the rates of addiction to opioids as well as other substances. <laughs> the Lower Cape Prevention Partnership at Harwich Chatham Coalition is focusing its efforts on prevention and education in the hope that young people and those that care about them will fully aware um, of the risks of substance use and abuse and including alcohol consumption, and support teens to embrace a healthy and substance-free lifestyle. This evening, we are pleased to present Dr. Kevin Hill, who is an addiction psychiatrist at McLennan Hospital, Division of Alcohol and Drug Abuse, and Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Hill's presentation will give us an up-to-date information on the science of addiction and how marijuana and other substances affect the brain. Much of this information is available in his book titled Marijuana, The Unbiased Truth About the World's Most Popular Weed. There will be opportunities to ask questions following the presentation, and we invite you to our vendors in the lobby. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Kevin Hill. Right. Thanks for the introduction, Carly. I appreciate it. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, you know, it's always great to be on the Cape. It's great to be here. It's such a nice high school. But I know that, particularly on a nice night like this, you got a lot of choices to make. So to come out and to try to learn a few things about substances and addiction, you know, I, I commend you for that. And so I will do my best to fulfill my end of the bargain and make sure that you leave with uh, several things, hopefully, that are new and, and helpful to you. So we're going to cover a lot of ground in a short period of time, so buckle your seatbelts. Um, I will answer any question that you have, either during the Q&A period or I'll stay till uh, all the, the questions are answered. But we're going to cover uh, essentially four things tonight. We're going to talk about marijuana. So marijuana has been hot, it's been in the news a lot, and I want to start by letting you in on a little secret. A lot of what you've heard about marijuana is either incomplete or just flat out untrue. And we're going to talk about that. A lot of it has to do with the fact that the loudest voices in the debate uh, with marijuana are people that have political agendas. So part of what they do is to try to distort evidence in order to support their political agenda. So we need to really dig down and figure out what the truth is about marijuana. We're going to do that tonight. We're talking about alcohol. So alcohol, I think, sometimes takes a back seat these days when you hear so much about marijuana and the third substance that we're going to get to tonight. And we can't 
fail to pay proper attention to alcohol. Because alcohol, as we'll see, is as dangerous as ever. Particularly this time of year, prom season, we always talk about uh, the worst case scenarios, what can happen. I know a lot of communities in the Commonwealth have actually simulated accidents and things to try to uh, have people understand, see how hard it can potentially hit home when, when bad things happen with alcohol. So we'll talk about what the statistics are and the dangers of alcohol tonight, and really some of the ways in which people fail to understand the full level of risk with alcohol. And then finally, we'll move on to the third substance, which is opioids. And so again, if you live in Massachusetts, particularly on the Cape, I know, um, we've been hard hit by opioids. And I think a lot of people have tried very hard to make strides in terms of treating opioids and raising awareness. And whether or not we've made strides is hard to know. I know a lot of people are interested uh, doing a talk on Friday, actually, with a lot of government officials relative to opioids. So we'll talk about that, see if there are things that we can do there. And then finally, we'll talk about treatment in general, because again, it's great to know what the facts are about substances, but what I want you to know, perhaps more importantly than what certain papers say or what the statistics are with substances, I want you to know what to look for. How do you figure out if somebody may have a problem with marijuana, alcohol, opioids? And then, what to do about it? Because this is what I do every day. It's hard to navigate the maze of different treatment programs, levels of care. And so I know enough to know that if you don't do this every day, it's really hard to have any sense. I mean, if, uh, you know, if you the, never had any experience before with addiction and somebody in your family's got a problem, it's almost impossible to know what the next step will be, where can you go, where can you turn to. And so one of the take-home points, we're going to have many tonight, but one of the take-home points is that you should never worry alone. There are people here that are willing to help. There are people all over the Cape and all over the state, frankly, that are willing to try to help you get matched up with the appropriate resources. And so we'll talk about what that looks like today. So you got my contact information. Feel free to think of me as a resource moving forward. I do want to thank um, my funders. So the work that I do, the clinical trials that I run that we'll talk about a little bit are funded by the NIH. So National Institute on Drug Abuse is the branch of NIH that funds my work. Also funded by some other foundations, uh, both local and national, and so I appreciate their support uh, in some of the work that I do like this, and then also the, the clinical trials that I run. And then you, you heard about the book. Feel free to check it out. You know, don't take my word for it, but you know, you can look online, Amazon, see what the reviews are there. And really, the book is designed to do a little bit of what we're going to do tonight. How do you identify somebody with a problem? What might you do about it if they're addicted to marijuana? We talk about the hot button issues as well: medical marijuana legalization, all that stuff. So, you know, we can have questions about that tonight. But if you're interested in more info, check out the book. So what do I do on a daily basis? What does an addiction psychiatrist do? I treat patients. So that's another thing, too. When you hear people talk about marijuana, let's say, think about it. Who, who are these people? What do they do? How do they really know, you know what the potential impact of this substance can be? So I know because I deal with patients every day who are granted at the extremes. And so that's something we want to talk about today is that the dose matters. How much you use of a substance over a certain period of time makes all the difference. So people often assume, you know, when you see a study that anybody who is using a particular substance can have these bad things happen. It doesn't always work that way, and oftentimes it doesn't. But if you are using to a certain level, usually daily or nearly every day, that's when the bad stuff happens. So that's one of the points. So I treat patients um, at McLean Hospital, it's a psychiatric hospital. We have patients there that have every kind of mental illness that you can imagine. When one of those patients has some problem plus addiction, my team of younger um, doctors goes and see them. So I train people on how to deal with those types of patients. I've worked all over, including Cape Cod Hospital, which is a great hospital. Uh, I have a private practice, and then for the sports fans out there, I know we've got the lacrosse team here, but if you're a sports fan, you know, like it or not, that drugs are in sports quite a bit, marijuana in particular. So I do a lot of work in sports, the local uh, pro baseball team, and then some leads to the, the NFL and the NBA. The second bullet is where I spend most of my time doing, trying to identify treatments for those people who are addicted. So again, some people use recreationally, they may or may not have a problem, but those people that definitely do have a problem, 
And so let's start talking about that. What does that mean? Addiction. What does addiction mean? So you can talk about manuals, uh, psychiatry manuals and definitions, but I like a simple definition of addiction. To me, repeated use despite harm. That's my definition. So if you're doing something despite the fact that you're having problems, usually in multiple key areas like work, school, and relationships, that's when you have an addiction. If I'm thinking about, okay, where am I going to get you know, my next you know, batch of perp 30s instead of going to you know, the soccer game that I was supposed to go to, or if I'm too drunk in the morning in order to go, you know, to, go to work, that sort of thing. That's when your use encroaches upon your responsibilities. If you're high and you don't get your homework done, that sort of thing. So that's a simple definition of addiction. And so my clinical trials are aimed at developing treatments for people who are addicted to marijuana primarily. So those people that say, look, this is a problem, I want some help, I want to give them something that actually works, and that's what we do there. Third bullet is what we're doing here. So I think it's important not only to identify treatments that work, but also do something that we're not really good at. Physicians are not really good at letting people know about what they do, letting people know what these treatments are. There's a lot of great research that's done in Massachusetts, right? We've got MIT, Harvard, places like that, a lot of smart people. But there's a lot of great research that's done in places like McLean and other places that we just don't, nobody knows about. You know, and so what good is it really, right? I mean, there's great research that people at my institution have done that I know nobody knows about. And so then the question becomes, how useful is it? Do we need to do a better job? I'm firmly committed to this belief that we, there are two levels to this. We need to identify things that work, and then you have to let people know about them so that they can use these treatments. And so that's what we're doing. Particularly when it comes to marijuana, we need to understand there's a tremendous gap between what the science says and what public perception is. And part of that has to do with the fact that physicians and mental health professionals, healthcare professionals do a poor job of educating people. And then also you need to think about platforms, because I'll let you in on another secret. So I'm, I'm really happy that you guys are here, but if Miley Cyrus or somebody of her uh, level of fame says something about marijuana today, they're going to reach a lot more people than I'm going to, even though you know, I'm glad you guys are taping this too, that's great. But So it's important to understand the tide that you're fighting there. So try to educate people on this issue. I work in a lot of schools, public and private, uh, with the Boston Public Schools. We're trying to educate all ninth and 10th graders on substances like we're going to talk about. And then the final piece is policymakers. So uh, success has varied over time, but we're trying to help policymakers move forward with some of these important policies that we're talking about every day. So let's move on to marijuana. It's going to be a little bit interactive. So this gives you a taste of what I do with students. So if you're just going to lie back and Relax, that's fine. I try not to pick on you, but would like some participation if you can. So I like to play when, when I meet with students, usually in much smaller groups than this, you know, this sort of myth fact to get an understanding to spark a conversation, because that's ultimately what we want to have. You know, I can talk at you tonight, but that's probably not going to be as good as it can be. You know, I know you guys have a lot of questions about this stuff. So we'll start with this one on marijuana, our first substance of the night. So common belief. Marijuana is a plant, it's natural, it has to be safe. How many people think that's a myth? All right, so people, I, thanks for raising your hand, I appreciate it. Thanks for participating. How many people think that's a fact? Brave souls out there. Oh, at least a couple there, that's great. Um, and that's fine, you know, that's something that I hear a lot, and that, that's okay, because that's where we gotta get things started to talk about this sort of thing. And so obviously, again, I wanna couch it all in the context. So we're talking about heavy use, daily use, the level of addiction. If you do that, if you're using to that level, yes, it absolutely is harmful. It can be very harmful. So this, the studies are quite clear. So with marijuana, as much as people can have good debates about the pros and cons of legalization, uh, medical marijuana, what isn't debatable is that when you're using a lot of marijuana, so daily, nearly every day, usually for a period of, of time, there are definitely bad outcomes that occur, particularly with young people. So that's another key idea to take home, is that the level of risk for these type of outcomes is far greater for younger people. So your brain develops into your mid-20s. So for some of us, it's all over. 
But for some of you, I mean, it's a really high-risk time. You know, so you have to take advantage of the time when you're developing. What you do, the decisions you make when your brains are developing are critical. Right? So argue with my daughters about drinking their milk. Right? You're growing. If you don't drink your milk now, you know, you're not going to reach your full potential. And this is the same sort of thing. Using substances at a young age, there's greater risk. So if you're young and you use marijuana regularly, then a host of things can occur. The first one are cognitive difficulties, so difficulties thinking. So we've done studies that claim brain imaging studies that show that a young person using marijuana regularly actually uses different parts of their brain to get the same amount of work done. It's kind of like revving your engine at high RPMs all the time. Probably not a good long-term strategy for success. Similarly, other studies that have been done around the country have shown that if you follow people over time, so this Madeline Meyer paper came out in 2012 in a top journal, follow people over time, the people that use marijuana starting at an early age and using regularly lost up to eight points of their IQ over time that they don't get back. Even if you stop, you can't get it back. So that's a critical developmental period, really, up into the mid-20s. Moving forward, another key area with marijuana, if you're using regularly, worsening anxiety. So some of you, you know, may say, wait a minute, marijuana helps anxiety. And that's what a lot of patients tell me. It's probably one of the top three reasons that patients say they use marijuana. But let's, let's talk about that. If you're anxious and you use marijuana, your anxiety does go down. Unfortunately, at some point, marijuana, the effects of marijuana are going to wear off. Then your anxiety goes back up. So you may try to medicate over time, but ultimately your baseline level of anxiety is increasing. So let's be clear. Using marijuana, the plant itself, to treat anxiety is not a good idea. We have other treatments that are better. Um, we may ultimately see certain components of marijuana be helpful for disorders on the anxiety spectrum. But right now, using the plant to treat anxiety is not a good idea. Also, worsening moods and worsening depression, if you have that and you're using marijuana regularly, worsening depression. And finally, this really scary idea here, this last one, is that increase of risk for developing a psychotic disorder. So you may have heard of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Uh, if you have a family history of one of those problems, you're more likely to develop that problem if you use marijuana regularly, particularly at a young age. So it doesn't cause that problem, but it makes it more likely. If you have the genes for something, the genetics, it's not automatic that you're going to have that problem occur, or you're going to express that problem. But marijuana use at a young age is something that can make it more likely, actually five times more likely. That's what one of those papers says. So, so again, if you're interested in any of those references, let me know. I'm happy to give them to you as long as you don't tell anybody for copyright reasons, right? Like you can get into trouble for that, I guess. We don't want that to happen. So, uh, marijuana versus alcohol. You may have heard our president say a couple of years ago, marijuana, you know, probably not as bad as alcohol. And I actually like, you know, I, I agree with that on the whole, probably. I mean, he's talking about how likely you are to end up dead using a substance on a given day. But the marijuana-alcohol comparison, I think, is a good one. Because, you know, as much as there are problems when we talk about using to the level of addiction, a lot of people can use alcohol and be okay. Uh, the data says that people can use marijuana and be okay, too. But I think a key difference is, is that as a society, we recognize that alcohol is dangerous, right? Everybody here knows alcohol is dangerous. You've all heard the ads and talked about ways to limit risk. Designated survivors, right? Think about how you're using. Think about how dangerous it can be if you're doing things under the influence. I would guess that none of you, or very few of you, have ever have heard anybody say, well, you know, when you're using marijuana, you need to think about this, and you, know, you can't drive. Nobody talks about that. We really need to. Because 22 million Americans used marijuana last year. That's a lot of people. The numbers have doubled in the last 10 years. So we need to think about marijuana like we do alcohol, potentially dangerous substance. Um, one of the key factors, uh, unfortunately, with any of these substances is, again, as I, like I said, only a fraction of people are going to go on to develop addiction problems, but we can't predict accurately who those people are going to be. So, for example, with marijuana, 
It's about one in six. One in six young people who use marijuana ultimately develop addiction. But as I like to say, if I have six 16, 17-year-old kids in front of me, only one of them is going to go on and have really serious problems, but I can't tell you which one it's going to be. Okay, so what that means from my end is that, you know, if a parent says, look, we found marijuana, or we think that, you know, that somebody's using them, you've got to bring the cavalry. There's too much at stake. And I know that, you know, it can be a pain sometimes for kids, you know, your parents are interrogating you, but they're just concerned. I mean, the, re the reality is there's too much to risk if you don't take it seriously. So that, that's an important piece. I think we've got to get the messages right. And I think we don't do a great job with messages with marijuana. And we'll talk about that in a second. Why is marijuana so complicated? I think there are a lot of reasons for that. First one is the American way tends to be, look, we need to think about things as absolutes. So when you think about the policy issues, you kind of see that, right? People are either staunchly for marijuana or they're, you know, very strongly opposed and they say things like I said, that you know, marijuana is harmless, marijuana is the greatest medicine ever. Other people say, you know, if you use marijuana, you're doomed, it's over. Both of those aren't true. So both sides, at times, are guilty of distorting evidence, like I said. I think that a lot of the answers with marijuana, even from a research perspective, are actually in the middle. So potentially dangerous, definitely. But a lot of people do use it without a problem. Uh, the second piece, people are misguided by their own experiences. So when I have a young person come in and I talk to the parents, like to have them come in, I hear one of two stories often play out with marijuana. Number one, yeah, okay, we knew our daughter was using with the friends, but we did that too, and we turned out okay. So I get that. Problem is, marijuana from today is really nothing like marijuana that people may have used in the 60s, 70s, or 80s. So far, far stronger potency, as we say, the strength, far greater. The other story has to do with opioids. People say, look, we knew, we knew our son was using at night in his room by himself, but at least he's not using heroin, right? And I get that too. But one of the points that we want to drive home here tonight is that people make decisions about what their drug of choice is. So somebody may prefer opioids, somebody may like alcohol, some people like marijuana. When they make that kind of decision, the level that they used to can make it really hard to distinguish what, you know, what they're using. In other words, by the time somebody comes into my office, it can be really hard to tell who's using marijuana, who's using alcohol, who's using opioids, because you have the same types of problems. Got suspended from school, got into trouble with the law. My wife says, look, I gotta stop using or She's going to leave, you know, that sort of thing. Work-school relationships are key areas. Um, and then finally, the, the idea about math. Math can be tricky. I don't, I don't like large numbers, especially late in the day, like now. But with marijuana, the numbers are huge. I mentioned earlier, 22 million Americans use it. So the people that become addicted, a small fraction of that, 9% of adults, 17% of kids. But as we talk about in the book, a small fraction of a large number can be a very large number. With marijuana, that's the case. So that means that although 9% of adults become addicted, when you think about that, we're talking 3 million Americans probably in the United States waking up first thing in the morning using marijuana, using throughout the day. Those are the people that we see using to the level of addiction. So that's hard for people to appreciate because most people haven't seen that. So I get it. This slide here shows some of the statistics with kids using marijuana uh, across the country, and it, to me, underscores a couple of things. Number one, how we need to do a better job of educating kids about marijuana. Number two, the fact that marijuana use is different than other substances, and therefore, we need to understand it, and we have to get it right. We have to be on the right side of this when we think about policy issues. So this is Monitoring the Future. One of the key survey studies comes out every year, University of Michigan. You see here that the green line shows that marijuana use is unlike any other substance at this point. If we put nicotine up there, sharply declining. Alcohol, gradually decreasing. As I like to say, alcohol is as dangerous as ever. Marijuana use is, has an ever so slight uptick, gradually increasing. But the red line 
shows that while the use is gradually increasing perception of risk, so how dangerous do kids think marijuana is, sharply declining. So that's kind of a dangerous predicament to be in. More people using, people thinking it's less risky. So that's a, a tough spot to be in. Why is that? Well, I think a, a lot of that has to do with how poorly we educate kids about marijuana. Because when I go into schools, I see one of two things. Either number one, they've never had anybody talk to them about it. Part of that is because students in, in schools are terrorized, or, you know, terrified of not preparing for standardized testing. Right? We can't take time away from preparing for the you know, MCAS or PARC or whatever it is in your school. Or, you know, they've had kind of the scare tactic programs of, of yesterday, which really don't work. You know, kids kind of know the truth about substances to some degree. And if you, you know, you've got a few minutes, really, before they tune you out, if you're just hammering home, you know, don't do this. You know, if you do this, it's all over, that sort of thing. So I think that we need to do a better job with this in order to try to reverse these trends. Second myth fact for you, so, you know, if you're dozing off. Um, number one, the, the second key myth fact, marijuana is addictive. Myth, fact. All right, that's an easy one. The, the degree of difficulty is gonna improve here. We're gonna get a little bit harder to move on. So I think you can, you can grasp, I already mentioned this one, uh, that, that it can be addictive for some people, right? Um, so as I mentioned, 9% of adults, 17% of kids, problems in multiple key areas. Uh, this idea of hard drugs, soft drugs, right? I don't like that type of comparison because, again, I want to drive home that point that no matter what the substance is, you can pick whatever substance you want. People can decide to use that to the extremes and have these kind of problems that we're talking about. And that's what we're getting at here. So this is, you know, so picture of the brain here. When you do things or substances or activities that are pleasurable, you have a release of certain chemicals in your brain, neurotransmitters, dopamine, probably have heard of before. So that's what this slide is about. And as you can see on the right side here, amphetamine, stimulant, like Adderall, cocaine, right? We know these things are addictive. We know that people, you know, get a rush when they use it. That often gets people to continue to use. We've got marijuana in the middle. Uh, on the bottom, I'll go with cheesecake. <laughs> the point is that things that we like are reinforced, right? When you do that, when you're shopping, gambling, using stimulants, whatever, dopamine is being squirted in your brain. So that makes you want to continue to do them. And, and so the, the point of this slide, why the scales are different, is that all three of these things cause dopamine to be released. So I think the take-home point for me is that as much as sometimes you hear people talk about hard drugs, cocaine's a hard drug, heroin's a hard drug, marijuana's a soft drug, I don't like that because, again, people make decisions about what they like to use, their drug of choice. And if your drug of choice is marijuana and you take that to the extreme, smoking every day, multiple times a day, to the detriment of these other key areas in your life, then yeah, I mean, it's every bit is bad as heroin in this case. So yes, it is addictive for some people. So that's an important point that we want to make. Uh, the other issue that we want to talk about here is that the consequences can occur, and this is blending into the other substances too, particularly alcohol. So when you think about people who are addicted to substances, we all have this idea, generally speaking, about people who are, you know, the, the drunk, the person who's drinking every day, not working, homeless, that kind of thing. And that's not what it looks like for everybody. So problems can occur with daily use, certainly, but also can occur if you use today. You use too much today. You use to excess today. You may make decisions that you wouldn't make otherwise. You may get in a car and drive, right? So you can be impaired under the influence of all three of the things that we're talking about today. Marijuana, alcohol, we're familiar with drinking and driving, obviously. Opioids, right? So we wanna take home that, that point as well, is that it doesn't have to be somebody who's using every single day. You can binge drink, we're gonna talk about that. You can use you know, lots of marijuana on a given day and, and get into these type of problems. 
the margin for error goes down as the, the degree of difficulty goes up, right? So everybody here probably knows people who are successful and use marijuana every day, you know? And so I see those people when ultimately the margin for error becomes too thin. You know, somebody who is, you know, a lawyer being successful, at some point you're gonna get to a point where it's hard to compete at the highest level. You know, athletes who are Division I athletes and, you know, they use marijuana regularly, they, things work out fine, they go to the pros, can't get away with it. So that's one thing. You know, you know people who use to obsess probably and are able to get away with it. Ultimately, usually your luck runs out. Either you, uh, you know, get into a problem at your current level or you move up and the degree of difficulty becomes higher and the margin for error goes down. So that's something to think about. That's something that often does draw people into treatment. You know, they say, look, I've been doing this for a while, and I, I just don't know if I'm reaching my potential. You know, I don't know if this job is really where I should be. You know, I had a good education, that sort of thing. So that idea is something to take home. Yes, people can get away with it, um, but at a certain point, it's harder to get away with it. So let's move on to alcohol. Myth fact. So here's where the degree of difficulty goes up a bit. All right, so I hope you're, you're ready on your toes. So myth fact, the majority of teenagers binge drink. Myth. All right, fact. All right, so uh, I think the myth people got this one right. Actually. So, so one of the key points that we want to make with all these substances is that most people, most young people don't do this. Right? So I know it seems that way. So one key thing, there's a series of studies that have been done that show that kids in high school and their parents think that way more people use all of these substances than actually do. Right? If you're somebody, if you're a young person who made a decision, I'm not going to drink, you kind of think, well, everyone else is doing this. You know, I'm missing out on something. Well, actually, the truth is, most people don't do that. A lot do it, and so those who we're concerned about, the levels of use are still too high, but it's not the norm, right? 22% of seniors and 14% uh, of um, sophomores in this case have binge drank in the last month, having three or more drinks, using to extreme on one particular day or over a series of days. It's not the norm. So people are making the right decision more often than not. Actually, but obviously, when there's so much at stake and you can have such dramatically bad outcomes, that's why we want, we always want the numbers to go down. Another myth fact teen drinking and driving has increased in the past 20 years. Myth. Fact. All right, so they are getting harder, right? But I still, everyone raising their hand, and you know, I appreciate that. You know, a lot of people are passing on it at this point. I don't know if they. <laughs> Are worried. I, you know, I really can't tell who's missing them. You know, there's too many people. And it's kind of dark. So, uh, so yeah, that's a myth. Teenage drinking, and driving has dramatically decreased in the last several years. So I want you to know that. But I also want you to know, probably more importantly, what this means to me. What this means is that, as we talked about marijuana before, how we need to do a better job of educating kids about marijuana. This kind of slide shows that we do a pretty good job of educating kids about alcohol. We do a pretty good job of educating kids about cigarettes and nicotine, right? Everybody knows alcohol is dangerous. Everybody knows that cigarettes are bad for you. You know, I've never had a patient come into me, ask to have me help them stop smoking cigarettes, and say, look, you know, I love this, this is great, you know, I, but I really, you know, I need to stop. Somebody says I need to stop, right? But it never happens, you know? And, and marijuana, it's very different. People feel there's at least some perceived benefit, and that's part of the work. You know, I, I know you think it helps you in this way, but these other areas we're having problems, so we need to talk in a risk-benefit fashion. But we know this stuff with alcohol, right? So drinking and driving has gone down. Uh, I think the message is pretty clear, but it also is still you know far too common, right? It just happens. It's the temptation that's there and people make bad decisions. I mean, that's always happening to some degree. We need to work as hard as we can to, to try to decrease those numbers. And I think, again, it's important to hammer home this alcohol point because I know you're hearing way more about marijuana, way more about opioids, 
than you are about alcohol right now. And the fact of the matter is, when you think about total societal costs, the costs of alcohol use dwarf everything else because more people use alcohol than these other substances. So again, we want to pay the amount of attention to it as we should. So now we're moving on to the big guns, opioids and the opioid epidemic. Uh, opioids like heroin, more addictive than alcohol and cocaine. Myth. Fact. All right, pretty good, pretty good. Yeah. So opioids are easy, okay, when it comes to this type of thing. These are the worst. The worst substances that you could possibly talk about. They are more addictive. You know, this slide actually talking about a quarter uh, of people who use heroin become addicted. I, you know, I personally would think it's a little bit higher. You know, because these are deadly, deadly drugs. I can't drive that point home enough. So, from a practical perspective, from, from my end, when I, somebody in my family um, is, is going to have surgery, or they're going to go to the hospital, you got to be careful when people talk about using Vicodin, Percocet, that sort of thing. Now, do you really need it? Because these are the strongest drugs that you're going to come across. And for those of us, you know, I'm one of those people with a family history of addiction. People with a family history of addiction are at higher risk. You know, they may never have abused substances themselves, but when you expose them to really powerful drugs like opioids, they're at higher risk. So I think, you know, in terms of a, you know, from a practical perspective, any use of these medicines from your dentist, from the ER, from you know, your surgeon, you need to think carefully. I'm not saying that there isn't a role for them, but just be aware. These are really, really dangerous substances. And we'll talk about it's really easy these days to make a transition. So what happens over and over and over again, somebody, you know, has an uh, accident, they go to see the surgeon, or they go to the ER, and they get a script for opioids. And a lot of them, they take them, and they're like, wow, you know, this, I've never had anything like this before. And that might be fine, and you know, they might, you know, go about their business, heal up, and that sort of thing. But that thought of, wow, you know, this is the most powerful drug I've ever had before, stays with them. And there are times when, you know, matter, different things are happening, but that thought never goes away. And sometimes people return to that. If they do do that, they begin to continue to use or abuse those substances. A prescription opioid is hard to get. You know, you might be able to get another script, but ultimately you're not going to be able to do that forever, probably. And then you're going to try to buy them or find them or steal them. And prescription opioids are expensive. It's about a buck a milligram or so on the street. And ultimately you're faced, many people are faced with a choice saying, look, I've stolen what I can to buy perk 30s or whatever, but you know, this bag of heroin here is you know, far, far cheaper. And so the end result is people that you would never, ever, ever imagine shooting heroin end up doing it. So that's what we've seen over and over again. Not just in Massachusetts, but around the country. But it's important to keep in mind. So I do like, you know, this slide, relative addictive potential. I mean, opioids are really at the top. And I think that the idea is accentuated by the fact that when you talk about the ability to end up dead on a given day, you can't beat opioids. So that's part of the problem. You know, if you've never used opioids before, you use them, you can end up dead. If you use them for a while and you stop or you get a bad batch, you know, if it has something else in it. Fentanyl is a drug you may have heard of before, far stronger than heroin. So if there's some fentanyl uh, in that batch, people end up dead. And it happens every day uh, throughout Massachusetts and all over the country. And that's why this epidemic is gripping us because people are, are dying literally every day. Um, this slide here shows that while all groups, so you got 2013 in green here, and 2000 in the darker blue, everyone's using opioids more. All groups are. But that young group in particular, so 18 to 44 Caucasian, I mean, that's, the, that's the big group here. You know, a lot of these folks live on the Cape. You know, so that's what we've seen. Everybody's increasing more opioids, you know, for a variety of reasons. Uh, some of which we'll talk about, but that, that younger group is especially hard to hit with that. Why are overdoses on the rise? Some thoughts, some of which you've heard of before, but there's just more prescriptions for prescription opioids for pain, right? Physicians like me were taught a few years ago that you know, pain's the fifth vital sign. 
How do you measure somebody's pain? Well, there's a scale that has like smiley faces on it. And people just, it doesn't sound very scientific, but that's what, that's what we do. So people are saying they're in pain, you're going to throw uh, powerful medications at them. There's also this era of, you know, if you come in to see me, and you may rate your visit on, online, and, you know, if I don't give you what you're looking for, are you going to give me, you know, one star, that sort of thing? So there's a lot of, a lot of pressure there. And certainly that's, that's something to consider. We talked about this transition from prescription opioids to heroin. And then again, stronger heroin is available. So it ups the ante. I mean, when you think about it, part of the reason that the heroin is stronger is because with more people selling it, if you're going to sell it and competing against people, you've got to do something to distinguish yourself. You want a stronger product. And so that stronger product is going to bring more sales to you. So, so that, those are the facts about, about those three substances, and we can answer more questions about it. But let's, let's move on to treatment, because again, I, I think that's a real important piece here, because... There are more substances than the three we talked about, but the commonality is when somebody's using that level of addiction, how do you get treatment if you decide that you need to or somebody thinks that you should? Typical case here, Johnny, 16-year-old high school sophomore, no previous addiction history, never seen a psychiatrist before, suspended after he was caught selling marijuana. So kind of like drunk driving, right? If you get caught selling marijuana, there's a good chance you're using too much marijuana, right? So there's a lot that has to happen for somebody to get on the radar, usually with marijuana. You know, it's, it's, a, it's usually a significant habit if something like this occurs. So this Johnny was using four or five times a day for two years with friends. Says, I'd rather be messed up, Doc. Messed up, messed is not the verb he used, actually. Um, but I think you understand what I'm getting at, right? Uh, so we'll go back to Johnny in a minute. But what do you look for? How do you decide, you know, this is something we've got to do something about? Well, I think you've got to think about, you know, what is normal for somebody? So in order to figure that out, you've got to know what normal is. And so for kids, I mean, there are things that can get things on the radar, right? You can have somebody who's a usually pretty agreeable kid, all of a sudden he's getting in fights, or having problems at school, grades are going down, so social problems, giving up activities. So... You know, this day and age, people are playing sports year-round, travel sports. So if you're somebody that, you know, a soccer player, you get to sophomore year, Johnny's a soccer player, he stops playing soccer in his sophomore year, just because he stopped playing soccer doesn't mean he has a marijuana problem, but it might, right? It's worth, it's worth looking at, asking some questions for what's going on. I mean, you've been you playing year-round for 10 years. Why aren't you playing anymore? I mean, it's worth... A conversation. Use in dangerous situations, so that's usually kids in cars with marijuana, let's say, or drinking, that sort of thing. And then this piece here, the last piece, is really the most common thing that I see. This is when people are sent to me by other docs in particular. Use despite obvious other problems. So they may be diagnosed. They may be already treated, so we're talking about anxiety, depression, ADHD. So a doc could call me and say, look, you know, I've been treating this gentleman, this young gentleman for a couple of years now. I had him on a bunch of stimulants, nothing's working, and all of a sudden, you know, we figured out that, you know, he told me that he's using marijuana every day. And so, you know, that's why it's not working. Or somebody's seeing a therapist, they're taking Celexa, it's not working. What could be going on, right? These are things, using substances, drinking regularly, binging on alcohol, or using marijuana, that can make it hard for other treatments to actually work, right? So people can be on the trail and not quite figure out the whole story. That happens a lot. So what do you do? How do you have a conversation if you think something's going on? I think there are really four key steps that we'll talk about. I talk about this uh, quite a bit more in the book, too. Preparation, conversation, evaluation, and referral. Preparation, build it before you need it. You got to have the ability to have conversations that matter. So I have a patient in my private practice, the age of some of the younger people out here. He tells me, look, my dad talks to me about two things, the Red Sox and the web. That's not going to cut it. I come from a family like that, you know, I mean, have to admit. 
But that's not the level that we need, right? You gotta be able to talk to your kids about important stuff. And so again, I mentioned my daughters, they don't wanna answer the questions that I ask them either, but you have to ask the questions. They're not gonna to wanna to answer on your time frame, but by asking the questions, you're saying that this is important. So that if you do that, hopefully, when things are going down, things bad things are happening, they're gonna be willing to talk to you. I think it's underscored by this era of technology, right? We just don't do that very much. If you go uh, out to a restaurant, you see a family there, and everybody's got their heads in there, looking at their phone, that sort of thing. So having conversations, talking to people about important things, not very common. Have an idea about what you're gonna say if there is a problem, what are you gonna do? If they, you know, if they say they're willing to get help, where are you gonna go? If they say no, what are you gonna do? Because that's a problem too, right? A lot of people are met with resistance, and when you get that initial resistance, a lot of people don't know what to do after that. So there are ways that uh, we can work around that. The conversation's pretty simple. Two things, I think, number one, what do you say? I think you just say, look, if you're a parent, you're a teacher, or a coach, I'm worried about you, I think you need an evaluation. I think you need to see somebody. So you're not making a diagnosis, you're not the bad guy, you're just saying, look, this is probably above my pay grade, I, you know, I don't know what's going on, I want you to talk to somebody who does this every day. That's what you need to do. And ultimately, who you see, you know, there are great people who are doctors, psychologists, social workers, you know, I don't, the alphabet soup stuff, I, I don't care as much about that, but they better be good. Because the window of opportunity is not open very long. And then to think about what will get somebody to try to get help, I think you know, that's a question that I often have to ask too. You know, what is important to somebody? What are they afraid of losing? Right? And it's the tangible things. So again, we talked about a lot of studies today. I've never had a, a young person come in to me and say, hey doc, look, I heard I could lose up to eight points of IQ if I keep using weed. You know, help me stop. Right? It's never happened. It's probably not going to happen. But what they do care about is, look, I want to go to Dartmouth. I want to play in the sectionals in three weeks. I want to keep using the car. That kind of stuff, like more tangible stuff. That's what you got to figure out. We'll get back to that in the evaluation, too. So like I said, there are people that want to help you. you got to talk to somebody who knows what they're doing because the windows are open small. And in that assessment, you know, a big part of what I do, as much as I believe in, you know, we're studying medications, we study different types of therapy, the biggest thing that I can do, the biggest thing that any therapist can do, if they're good, is to build an alliance with somebody. Like I said, with technology, talking to somebody, having a conversation is kind of rare. So if you do that, if you're listening to somebody, they say, wait a minute, this person, you know, seems to be interested in what I'm saying. Hopefully, by the questions that you ask, you let them know that you know a few things about it. And then if you've done that, you build that alliance, ultimately, they're going to be willing to come back when you know, they want to get some help. So that's another kind of secret here, or not so secret in my case, is that a lot of people don't want to do what I think they should do right away. I want to be clear about what that is when we talk about that in the referral, but a lot of times, it takes some time for somebody to get ready to get help, and the hope is they decide to do that before they've lost everything. Um, in terms of the, you know, this MI here, motivational interviewing, what that means, it's kind of just a psychobabble term in some ways, but what I think about that as being is that, you know, we talk about the tangible things, is that part of my job in that evaluation is to figure out, you know, what's one reason that they would change their use of marijuana, alcohol, opioids, whatever it is, because their one reason is better than 10 I could give them. So my job is to figure out what's important to them. If I get that one thing that they care about, sports or, or their future, you know, what they study, that sort of thing, then I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm good. I feel like I can get the rest. We can make the rest work. So I got one hook there. In terms of referral, what does treatment look like? Um, you know, so highest level, the lowest level, residential care. It doesn't happen all that much, you know, so I like some of the TV shows that you guys have seen, but most times people aren't getting on a plane going away for six months. It's not reality. Um, it's outpatient care. You know, a lot of great outpatient care on the Cape, Gosnell, you know, there are other places that, that really do a nice job. Um, so you're living at home, you're going somewhere. If things are really bad, you're in you know, what we call a partial program, let's say, that's every day. Uh, for five, you know, for two weeks, let's say, that sort of thing. Ultimately, you might be talking to a therapist or a counselor. 
and then groups, you know, which brings me, we'll talk about this in the Q&A, so this, you know, a lot of 12-step on the Cape here, these, these dry dock folks who approach me, so it seems like they're doing a great job, big believer in self-help groups, I and mean, I think they're very, very helpful, so I think they have a, a table out there. The point is that even if you're seeing a therapist, if you're taking a medicine that you should be taking, you know, that's a couple hours a week at best. And if you can, you know, have a group that you go to with people who are in a similar position that have been around the block, that can be very, very helpful and very, very powerful. So I definitely uh, endorse that where possible. What does treatment look like? Depending on the substance, detox may not be necessary. Really, of the three substances we talked about tonight, alcohol is the only substance that you absolutely have to do a detox from. Because the reality is, if you're using alcohol every day, stop abruptly, you can have a seizure and that can be fatal. So insurance companies will pay for you to do detox. And they don't want to pay for much, as you probably know. Uh, so they'll pay for that. Opioids, even opioids. I mean, you, it's hard to get an inpatient detox. So opioid withdrawal, while very, very uncomfortable, is not life-threatening. So that's a distinction that's made. Like I said, you're not going to go away to rehab, generally speaking. Um, you just want to talk to somebody and, and do that alliance work that I, that I talked about before. So, so back to the case, and then we'll get to uh, some closing thoughts and some Q&A, which I think will be interesting. So Johnny started talk therapy. Uh, the idea was he was going to see a therapist once a week. If things went well, you keep doing that for a while. If things don't go well, you increase the level of care. So you might go into a program, right? So this is not a static thing. This changes depending on how people are doing, which is why you need to see somebody so they can get a sense for how you're doing. It's not like you go in one time and that's it. You know, that's, that's not going to work. Um, he talked about in his treatment, you know, why he felt the need to get messed up on the weekends as opposed to facing things, you know, as his, his sober self, as we say. Um, so, so those are difficult issues and it takes time to work through. So to sum it up, awareness is really the name of the game. So you're ahead of things by just by being here, and I appreciate that. I, I would guess you've probably have done some other things on your own to learn about this. So you're continuing to make progress, and that's great. Communication is key, right? It's hard to do in this era of technology, right? We're texting people. We don't like to talk anymore. like to send emails that people misconstrue, um, and so communication is huge. You've got to be able to have these talks that are hard. You know, if you're going to support somebody, if you're going to try to help somebody, if you're going to have an idea of how they're really doing. So in the community and in your family, usually there are people that want to help you. Definitely true uh, in the community here. Never worry alone. It's a helpful thing to say all the time. And again, you, know, you should never be struggling on your own when there are a lot of people that do want to help you, and I know that's the truth. Uh, the Cape, definitely. And then the, the final thought here is, is, again, an important thought. So you guys heard many, many horror stories about addiction. People who end up dead, lose their lives, wreck their families' lives, that sort of thing. I want you to know, if, you, if you're not aware of this, no matter what the substance is, no matter how bad it can be, people get better. That's why, that's why I do this. I mean, some people don't get better, but people do get better. A lot of times they're the people that you would never expect to get better. People who are shooting a gram of heroin for you know, more than a year, they've been in treatment a whole bunch of times, they come to see me and like, what am I going to do? But sometimes those are the people that get better if you really work at it. You know, maybe there are things they haven't done, they haven't really done all the things that they could possibly do. Maybe they just haven't had somebody in a while that really cares about how they're going to end up. You know, so people do get better. I think that's you know, one of the, the most important things that, that I can emphasize tonight is that it's never, never hopeless, no matter how bad it can seem. It can definitely seem really bad, I know, at times. But people want to help you, uh, and you, you definitely can get better. So I've got some time to take some questions. I know we've got tables out there, but I'll, I'll take some questions now. And then when it's time to disperse, you know, I'll be down here and I'll answer some more questions. So thanks for your attention. Thanks. And if you don't have a mic out there, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Okay, so we'll start there, right there. Um, it seems as if uh, at times lethal overdoses come after someone has been clean for a period of time mm -hmm. or they've just gotten out of rehab. Is that because there's a change in tolerance? Yes. To that? Yep, so the question was, 
Um, sometimes people overdose on opioids right after they uh, exit treatment. So why is it, why are you more likely to have that occur? And you know, the, uh, you correctly asked, you know, does it have to do with tolerance? So tolerance is you know the body's acclimating to a particular substance. So um, you need more and more of the substance to get the same effect. So if you are somebody that uses perk 30s, and you know, you're going to need more of that in order to get the same effect. A lot of times people who are using opioids, they'll tell you that you know, they've been using for a while. They don't get high anymore. It's just a question of preventing withdrawal symptoms. But the reality is when you go in to do a detox, you've been free from opioids for a while. Your body is repairing itself more or less, and your tolerance goes down. So you're at high risk. So that's something that we see. People get great treatment, whether it be detox, whether it be even in a residential facility. But when you leave, danger is high because you're putting somebody back in an environment that has a lot of triggers, and you know we're talking about deadly substances. So that is why people are especially high risk right after treatment. Yep, right there. Can you recommend a book for somebody that is an opiate addict in recovery? In terms of what, what aspect, uh, so we're talking about books for opioid addiction. Yeah. Um, is there some aspect of it that you're concerned about or I think there's, you need more guidance? Well, it's a, it's a person in my life that just hasn't, you know, I think it's been probably eight years of struggling with addiction and I'm trying to find inspirational reading, but factual, you know, you know kind of something that would all of those. Yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of memoirs like that, you know, none of them jumped to mind for me. I mean, there, there are a lot of success stories, you know, I was uh, in, in Weymouth last night um, talking to a group like this, and, you know, Chris Heron is somebody who's mm -hmm. had one of those success stories. So I think, you know, that can be inspirational for people, you know, it, it depends. I mean, I, you know, I, I can't recommend one particular book. I mean, uh, I think there are a lot of areas that, that you can go to for... Um, just to have that notion reinforced that this is not hopeless. Mm -hmm. Other questions right there. Yep. Hi, in your practice, um, how do you deal with lack of motivation to recover? Yep. So in my practice, how do you deal with lack of motivation or resistance or um, really not wanting to be there? So we deal with it all the time, uh, especially with marijuana. So marijuana is something that uh, it's very rare that people are going to call me up and say, look, i got a problem with weed. I need to get help. So people who are pushed in to see me, uh, you know, another kind of a secret, if you make it into my office, I know a part of you recognizes that you've got to be there. Right? So there may be a lot of resistance. Um, but again, if I do this the right way, if I build that alliance and you know, talk about things that we may have in common, or you know, if I'm trying to figure out what's important to you, I can I can build upon that. You know, just to point out what the differences are. You know, on my consultation service, there may be people who have absolutely no interest in getting help. You know, when you drop into a unit, you know, where people are depressed, let's say, and you're asked to see them by their team, you know, they may not be any interest. But if somebody's parents, employer wants them to see me in my private practice, let's say, in my office. I know that if they made it there, there's a part of them that wants help. And so motivational interviewing, you talk about stages of change, you know, Prochaska and De Clemente, just if you want to look at that reference, talking about people, some people are pre-contemplative, they, they don't want to have anything to do with it, but those aren't people that are in your office. You're, you move past that. So part of what we do in readiness and alliance, I mentioned that, trying to move people along. And, and so if you build that alliance, if you underscoring the importance of the need for treatment. People might not want to do it right away, but you know, if you have that alliance, and you move them along, you're closer to having them want to get help. But we deal with that type of resistance all the time, and I think that's where motivational interviewing, trying to meet somebody where they are is a very good start. Thank you. Yep, right there. Yeah, no, that's a great question. You know, I, I usually have heard all the questions, but I haven't heard that one before. So talking about 
uh, increase substance use relative to the, you know, the, the sports culture and the travel teams and things like that. And again, it's very different. You know, I've, I've had a modest uh, athletic career, and, I, and it's very different from what I'm used to. You know, people are starting a lot earlier. You know, I didn't get to year-round play until high school, at least in an organized way. So, um, you know, I think that, that there are more injuries, definitely. I think so. You're more likely to come across an, an opioid prescription, and so that, that definitely is. I mean, I'm not as familiar with the statistics there, but certainly anecdotally, um, you know, we see people who have overuse injuries, hips, uh, baseball, um, rotator cuff, and that sort of thing. And when you're prescribed an opioid, again, anybody who's prescribed an opioid, it just it's a high risk thing, and so we do see that. I think it is a major. It's a it's a major issue. Um, and one to be wary of, you know. And, and there are people who know a lot about sports that uh, don't advocate for that type of specialization at an early age. And I think that's one of the reasons is that your bodies just aren't made to do that. If you do get one of those injuries, then you might be opening up the door to these other issues. But that's a good point. Right there in the back. Yeah, so question was, what are my thoughts about naltrexone? Vivitrol is the brand name. So naltrexone is an opioid blocker. Um, and so it's FDA approved for treatment for alcohol use disorders and opioid use disorders. Vivitrol is a brand name, um, injectable naltrexone. And so, you know, I, I like naltrexone. I think it's a good medicine. Um, the, whether you need to be injectable or not, that's more of a debate. You know, I'm less of a fan. It's expensive. You know, you can get it in a pill form too. But I think the point is that I think that uh, addiction works in a lot of common pathways, and so an opioid blocker may be helpful for opioids and alcohol, and maybe other addictions as well. My big thing with medications for addiction is that. I think you got to have the other pieces in place before you use a medication, right? So if somebody comes to me and they want a script for naltrexone, and that's all they're going to do for alcohol, alcoholism or an opioid addiction, you know, it's not going to work. I just don't think so. But if you have a therapist, you're talking to somebody every week, you know, you're you know, working with these dry dock folks, you're going to self-help groups, you know, you're doing all these other things, then, yeah, I mean, I'm all for using a medication in that way. I just worry that a lot of patients that you know, we see aren't doing all the things they need to do. And, and I know it's hard, right? You don't, nobody wants to go, nobody wants to see me every week, right? And I think that it would be a lot easier if I just took a pill every day. And so I know there's that temptation, but when you think about it, we got this huge problem that you've developed over years that's impacting all these areas of your life. It's wreck, wrecking your life. You think a, a bottle of pills is going to fix it? I mean, it's relative, that's kind of simplistic, you know. So I, so I think they're a good tool to have. I like to use medications when appropriate. I just worry sometimes that people have too great of the expectations of medicines to be magic bullets. It doesn't work like that. Yep, right next to there. The green shirt. Yeah, you know, actually, that was a question that came up yesterday. I have to say, I mean, anything is possible. I'm not doubting the, the tr truth of the story. You know, I, I see a lot of people, a lot of people with marijuana problems. I don't see a lot of marijuana that is adulterated in many ways. You know, really, it's more about how strong can we get it. You know, how much, and if, and if you're, you know, if marijuana, the plant itself, and we even talk about the different forms today, but if you, you know, if, if the marijuana that you get is not strong enough for you, then you look into other forms. You know? So there's hash oil, you know, distilling marijuana down into really, really pure uh, THC, which is the active ingredient. So that's the race that I see more of, more so than people getting marijuana that has other stuff in it. 
Opioids definitely cut a lot, or uh, you know, um, ecstasy and other things. Um, but yeah, no, and somebody raised a similar question. Um, so that that may, you know, a lot of times these things are kind of the curve. You know, somebody like me may be a bit slow to catch up to the curve. You know, the first responders and police are you know, on the, the front lines, and so they may catch things a bit earlier than me. I mean, I definitely I talk to a lot of patients, but I, I hadn't heard I hadn't heard much about that um, marijuana being. Uh, cut. I mean, certainly people may dip marijuana in formaldehyde, things like that, but not, I'm not familiar with um, opioids and, and marijuana being mixed like that. So that's something new, and I appreciate you sharing that. Yep? Can you just speak to the use of synthetic marijuana? Yeah, yeah, synthetic marijuana. So that's, again, you know, we could talk about things like this all night, but I have my own synthetic marijuana talk, essentially. And uh, like I said, I do a lot of work in sports, and so we'll talk about why that's relevant with synthetic marijuana. Synthetic marijuana, K2 spice, but it could be a whole bunch of things. I mean, it's kind of a cat and mouse game. The, the government has made certain forms of it illegal. What it is are synthetic versions of THC. So THC is like what we call an agonist, a powerful piece of marijuana that makes you high. Uh, when you have the marijuana plant, you've got a whole bunch of pieces in it, cannabinoids, 60, 80 cannabinoids, THC, is the main one that makes you high. CBD cannabidiol is the one that you've probably heard of. That's kind of like a buffer for THC. Synthetic marijuana, you don't have any buffer. So you got a pure THC-like compound, and so you get the best and the worst. You know, you can have a powerful high, but the problems with marijuana usually are paranoia, psychosis, things like that. And so with no buffer, you're more likely to have the bad things happen with synthetic marijuana. Who uses synthetic marijuana? People are going to be drug tested. So group home residents, military, the athletes that I mentioned, you know, if you're going to get drug tested in spring training or, you know, you're in the, the program, substance of abuse program. So, um, yeah, so synthetics are a real problem. On the whole, you know, a bag of synthetic weed is, is much more dangerous than, than regular marijuana. So it's a major, major problem. Yep. To prohibit convenience stores yourself? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the DEA is trying, you know, that they, you know, K2 and Spice, like I mentioned, has a certain chemical formula, and so the DEA has outlawed, you know, certain forms, but these are made in China, essentially, and so, you know, you can tweak the formula, have a new product out. Um, I know communities are trying to uh, discourage convenience stores and head shops from selling these, but... You know, it's hard. People want to make money, and uh, sometimes people sell dangerous substances. These are these are nasty, nasty drugs. You know, really, really harsh and powerful. Yeah. How do you feel about the um, two theories, tough love versus, um, I guess, love? Just um, when it comes to drug addiction. Well, so how do I feel about tough love versus love? Well, I know it's weird unless you've gone to like. Or, yeah, that's a great, that's for great. families, that seems to be part of the discussion. You know, different families using those two. Yep. No. So, so what we're talking about is somebody has a problem with addiction, and it's a you know long term problem. They've been in treatment multiple times. And at what point do you pull away? You know, do you not let them stay in your house. Do you not give them money. It's a really really tough position to be in. People, you know. Uh, family members get worn out, that sort of thing. Um, you know, every case is different. And, you know, I, I, what I want to emphasize, you know, what I think is important to emphasize, and I know families do this to a large degree, is, look, we're here for you. We want to help you. You want to get help. We want to help you. But some things are not helpful. You know, giving you cash, you know, is not going to be helpful for you. Sometimes people make really difficult decisions about, look, we can't... Um, you know, essentially enable this kind of behavior. And so those are really, really tough spots. And another difficult aspect of it is you can give somebody an ultimatum and say, look, you got to do this or we're not going to do this. But ultimately, the person that's saying that is the one that's making a choice, right? They're going to make, they've already decided what they're going to do. So now, are you, are you really not going to let them sleep in your house? I mean, these are heart-wrenching, difficult spots. You know, what I would say is, 
every case is different. You know, I would say if you're, and I know that you mentioned Learn to Cope, which is a great organization, it's really helped a lot of people. Um, but you need to be working with one of those groups. You know, if you're facing that, I mean, that's really advanced level stuff. And if you're at that point where, you know, you tr you've spent a lot of money on treatment, and getting help, nothing's working, like, you need to have really high level people help you make those kind of decisions. Um, I, I don't envy it, you know, it's really sad. And like I said, you know, I've, many people, you know, that, that I've worked with in the past have used substances to the point where they, they've died. You know, they've drank themselves to death and it can't happen. And that's just terribly sad. Um, so you, know, you try to do everything you can and there are a lot of people out there that are doing everything they can and it doesn't seem to be working. It's a really uh, hollow place to be, an empty feeling. Um, so, so that's where support groups are really helpful. Yep, on the, on the right there. What are your thoughts, pro and con, regarding medical marijuana, and are you concerned or not concerned about the possibility of marijuana becoming legalized in our state? Oh, good, good questions. So medical marijuana. So, um, you know, I've written uh, a lot on medical marijuana. I do think that there are places, there's certain, you know, there are, aside, we have two FDA-approved cannabinoids that are approved for two things, nausea and vomiting and appetite stimulation. Beyond those two things, I think there is good evidence for chronic pain, neuropathic pain, which is kind of a burning sensation you get in your nerves, and um, spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis. So my thing is, there is a place for medical marijuana, not as a first-line treatment, but as a treatment for a certain number of conditions. The problem is, in the Commonwealth and many other states, you got people using marijuana for this many things. And so I think the regulations are poor. Second question, am I concerned about legalization? Yeah, you bet I am. Because the ballot initiative that we're going to vote on on November 8th, I think it is, is just not, it's not very good in my view. And I could tell you why if you want, but it's, it's, it's weak. You know? So conceptually, you know, whether adults should be able to use I mean, that's a whole other story. But when you tell me that you got a law written by advocates that, you know, doesn't do certain things that you really need to do, I don't feel good about it. So I am concerned. And I'm also concerned that our legislature hasn't really done anything on the issue as well. So, uh, yeah, they're worrisome um, topics, certainly. Yep, right in the middle. The, uh, referring to the slide you had about uh, teenagers who were binge drinking. Yep. Binge drinking, I think you said, is like three three drinks in a day. Yeah, it's, it's rarely three, right? I mean, we're talking about people who are having more than that, but it, yeah. Um, do you have any numbers on how many of those, what percentage of those who are binge drinking go on to serious addiction? Go on to what? To addiction. Well, so here's the thing. Um, it's kind of changed recently in the sense that the latest diagnostic manual that we use, the DSM-5, um, captures both binge drinking and daily drinking as what we call an alcohol use disorder. So if you're somebody that habitually binge drinks, technically you do meet criteria for an alcohol use disorder and you know, probably addiction by how we define it. Um, you know, it doesn't, it's not absolute. I mean, you know, I can not drink very much and then have 10 on Saturday, you know, have, end up in a world of hurt. You know, that doesn't mean I probably don't meet criteria, but most of the time, it's something that somebody continues to do over time. So we'll take a couple more questions and I'll stay down here. I know they've got some great tables up that people want to have you go to. Yep? Millions. Yeah. Yep. So we're talking about uh, trends and trying to restrict prescription opioid prescriptions. And so, yeah, so this, this is a major epidemic. There are a lot of people in mass medical society, people are into the government. You know, people are doing what they can to do this. 
I, I also want to say that, you know, opioids are, are very, very useful medicines in certain cases. I'm just saying that, you know, any powerful medicine that we decide to take, you've got to weigh the risks and the benefits. And there are times when you should use them and they can be very, very helpful. But we know that they're overprescribed. And so there are things that people are doing. We're educating more doctors about this. We want people to use uh, what's called a prescription monitoring program. So if I'm going to prescribe an opioid, I need to look at the prescription monitoring program to see if this person has gotten scripts elsewhere, if they may be somebody that might have a problem with addiction, or that sort of thing. So there are a, a lot of steps. The governor has talked about a seven-day max limit to the number of opioids that you could Prescribed. So I think there are steps being taken, definitely, and maybe it's something where there's going to be a bit of a lag for us to see the results. Uh, so hopefully we'll see some results soon. But, but a lot of people are doing a lot of good things, I think, on that end. And hopefully we're going to keep doing more you know, rather than just talking about it. So that's why this kind of night is great. So I'll take one more and then I'll stay down and have to answer some more questions. Anybody else? Yep, right there. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh, I do this around the area as well. And uh, I, I just wanted to ask the question, if people wouldn't mind raising their hand, how many parents are here tonight? Oh, God bless you. God bless you for coming. I don't know why you came, but thank you for coming. Because it's very hard to get parents out here to these education meetings that are so vital. Because you don't know what you don't know. What you don't know can kill your kids. And as I'm a, a family practitioner here on the Cape, and I speak to many of the points that he's made tonight, parents have to be part of the solution, and part of that is educating yourself about what to look for and how to have that conversation. And um, also how to handle your own medications responsibly, because most of the pill use in kids is right out of the family medicine cabinet first. And so handling your own medications, handling your own uh, thoughts and emotions <coughs> about how you speak about drug use, how you talk about people who have substance use disorders may make it difficult for your child who may have a problem to come to you if they think they're going to be judgmental or stigmatizing them. So taking sort of your own educational and emotional pulse about where you stand. Do you feel ambivalent about this? Are you as a kid of the 60s, 70s, or 80s still using yourself? All those messages affect if your child will even come to you if you have a problem. So I thank you so much for coming to this program tonight and try to get other parents to come to more programs because the education just as important for parents as it is for the young people. Yeah. Well, that's a great point. Thanks.